Welcome to Crosspoint Church's podcast, Behind the Point. My name is Adam Robertson, and if you didn't join us last week, make sure to go check out that podcast, but we're still talking to Josh Johannes, and this week we're going to talk about what it was like when he was integrated in the church. Of course, last week we talked about his testimony and how he got to the church that he is currently pastoring at. But Josh, let's face it, you were talking about it was a different change of pace. Before you were at a larger church, you're now at a church that is calling out numbers from hymnals and a whole different pace than what you're used to. Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, I'd had that experience in Kansas of traveling to those churches. So I had kind of an idea of, of what was going on, but it, there is a difference between Western Kansas cowboy churches and, and uh, you know, a, a deep Ozarks country church. And uh, yeah, so I... It was it was jarring. You know, one of the things that was there was a number of things that were jarring about the church. One of them is that you know, be one. I say it's a country church, and it is, except that you know, it's in between Forsyth and Branson, and the area's kind of on the highway. Their stuff kind of has grown together a little bit, and so this church is from 1879. It was a one room schoolhouse. Uh, they'd had to knock it down, and I think 2004 it got condemned, and they rebuilt. But it looks like like it did originally, and um, but out here in what should be the country, just a stone's throw from the church, uh, First Baptist Forsyth moved, and they've got this huge, beautiful church, you know. And so I am in. I used to say, it looks like it looks like our church is the tool shed of this <laughs> church. You know what I mean? So it's a country church that is not at all isolated. And so there's this giant Southern Baptist church right beside me who, uh, in like my second year, their pastor left and my like smartest professor comes and fills the pulpit there for a year. So now I'm preaching next to this giant church where my, like anything, anything I smart, I say, just something I heard from this guy, he's (laughs) preaching there. And then on the other side of me is this, uh, contemporary church, the river, that is just bumping and flowing and doing great. And I'm thinking to myself, what am, what am, you know, what am I doing here? And you know, what, what's, what's the plan? What are we, what are we doing? And I had a really good professor at, at SBU named Mike, Dr. Mike Furman, um, who taught me a lot about preaching, taught me a lot about ministering. And he'd given the advice that when you started a new church, don't change anything for a year. And, and so I'd heard that, and I was trying that, didn't didn't necessarily execute it perfectly. Um, but so I just thought, I'm just going to get to know these people, figure out what's going on, and uh, in a year, I'll, I'll see what to do, you know? And uh, it was it was a tough year. There was, uh, you know, it was funny, I had to go to, I had to, go to um, association meetings and meet other ministers and deacons. I remember going to those meetings and I meet these other ministers and deacons. I can read on their faces that it's like dead man walking. You know, they're like, (laughs) here's this, you know, green 22 year old kid who's not even a general Baptist, uh, has come down to, you know, the heart of Taney County. He's going to get eaten alive. Like you just see it on the face. And you know, I do it now. I, I got that sense. But at the same time, there were people who, uh, were very, very kind to me. Like Sue Clayton uh, was at, an, at another church being a children's minister at the time. And she just offered me tons of help, tons of advice. Uh, I called her a lot those first few years. Yeah, so I really I really clung to their friendship and and that helped me. But, you know, that first year, there were a number of characters in the church. Uh, there was one guy in the church who had uh, filled in as a preaching sometimes and was older and had wanted to be the pastor and had applied to be the pastor. And when they hired me, they said, you know, we're not hiring you to be the pastor, but you can be the associate pastor. Okay. Uh, which, what a horrible idea, you know? <laughs> and I remember my first association meeting, I go to the presbytery, I'm just meeting these people. And I sit down in the meeting and they announce, this is Josh Johannes. He's the new minister of Sardis John Baptist Church. And we're going to be giving him a, a license, uh, and in a year when he has completed all these requirements, we're looking to ordain him. Uh, any questions or concerns? And this guy stands up. Oh, no. And he goes, I just want to say he strikes me as pretty selfish. 
that he isn't sharing the, you know, isn't letting me preach. And I think this is not a good idea. I thought, what just happened? Because <laughs> I've been at the church about three oh, weeks. Gosh. I've been there about three weeks. That's a terrible uh, way to start. <laughs> and I thought, what? Uh, and, uh, and so, yes, yeah, so it was a year of some tricky challenges. And that was... So did you feel like you had any friends in the church? And do you feel like those friendships maybe helped encourage you in maybe a, a year of struggles? Uh, no, not at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, at the time, uh, it was a, I didn't have friends and, uh, and it was lonely and I can remember really just thinking, well, here's what I'll do all. Cause I had been there a few months and already the church was back up to about 40. There were people who had, had been gone since Sue left that, uh, started coming back. Um, and so the church was doing good. I thought, you know, I get this church up to 70 or whatever and I can, move on to what's next, you know, just keep climbing the ladder. Yeah. Um, which is what people really, you know, it sounds like a terrible thing to say, but that's, we, that's what we all, it's going on in the back of our heads, you know? Um, I can remember one Sunday standing in the church and I was looking through the trees and looking at that first Baptist that's next to us. And I'd been over there once and the pastor in his office had leather couches and there's no office at Sardis. There's just three rooms. And just thinking to myself, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna grind it out, and someday, I'm gonna have me leather couches. I'm gonna have me a big desk and my name on the door. And I remember God saying to me right then, "Is that what you want? Because you can get leather couches. Well, you can work, and you can get that office. You can get anything you want. Is that what you want, Josh? Or do you want something different? Do you want something more?" And I just it just stabbed me right in the heart, and. So you're young in ministry. I I was I'm still I'm 31, but I was 22 at the time, and I'm listening to all this advice. You know, here's what you got to do to get your church going. Implement this, implement that, do that, and I'm thinking none of this will work. You know, and we don't have anybody that can play music here, and I don't know what I don't know what to do. Um, I just decided for about those three years, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get to know these people, care about them, do a good job, be a minister for them. And uh, I'll pay my dues, and I'll and I'll hit the road when it's time to hit the road. And so I did that. I, I I worked. I did that. It was it was enjoyable. I got I did stuff at church camp. I did all kinds of stuff. Got to know people, and the church continued to grow. And um, you know, it grew financially. It grew in numbers. Um, there was just a happy spirit. You know, it took about a year and a half for. You know, I got there, things were just, there was just kind of a gloomy spirit there. You, if you've been around to little churches that aren't doing well, you know that, that feeling. By about a year and a half, it had really kind of, there was a joy there. So you'd walk in, and just the spirit of the place, you could feel the friendliness and the kindness, and just kind of an upbeat, you know. We weren't trying to be anybody else, we were just ourselves. It was very it was a very family kind of, of feel all of a sudden that was really growing. Now... Y- I know um, people who that's what they do is they travel to churches and they're looking at to make them grow. And so they're there for a short amount of time. And I know, you know, pastors who they have their objective goal and, and they go in, they do it and they leave. But my question is, why did you end up staying then? Yeah. What was it that kept you there? Because once when you kind of get that mindset of I'm going to achieve these lists of goals, what was it that kept you there? So I'd love to lie to you. I'd love to just tell you that I'm this saint, you know. Uh, but here's what happened. I'd been there about three and a half years, and the church was at about 70, which was full. The church comfortably says about 75. So we were at 70. It was full. I felt like I'd done. I was the such and such of the presbyter, and I had all these different titles. I had made myself a nice little resume. And so I start, uh, and I wasn't making any money. Like, And we had just had our first child, and I thought... That this church can't pay me, and I don't even want to ask, and so it's probably just time for me to go. So I applied at some places, and I went and met a really good older minister who connected me and to something. And I went and I, I interviewed at a, at a church, and uh, I went and I met that church, and when I met them, I I didn't like them, <laughs> uh, and. I just looked, I looked around and I thought, these people don't know me and I don't know them. And they're kind of looking at me like I got to prove myself. 
and they all seem kind of hoity-toity. Uh, they just weren't my people. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes you go someplace and you're like, these are my people. These were not my people. And so I left that and ended up calling and, and telling them, you know, uh, that I was out. And one of the reasons why I, I'd kind of made that push to leave at the time, because the church was growing and the way it was growing, we needed to do something like we need to start saving for a building. We need to start doing all this kind of stuff. I didn't want to start a bunch of stuff at the church and then right when things were happening, leave. I just, you know, sorry guys, God's called me because that happens all the time. And maybe God does call people. But as a, as a frustrated young man, I'd always get mad at something like that. Like, yeah, uh, it doesn't, doesn't feel good to be somebody's stepping stone. And so I didn't want to build a whole lot of excitement and then leave. And so I was talking to God and I was saying, I don't know, I don't know what you want me to do. Um, but I'm just going to, I guess I'm just going to commit. And, and that really transformed me as a minister in my church. And you talk about friendship. That's when, when I decided I'm not looking anymore. I'm not, I'm not opening up a thing to see where else I can go. I'm done. I'm here. Suddenly I started caring that much more about the people and my ideas for the church started to change. And, you know, you talk about, here's just an example. You talk about a little church and being old fashioned. And, uh, I think at the time, lots of times when I said the church was old fashioned, I was, what I was really saying was, well, the music's not that good. You know, it smells musty. Uh, the, the people were all a little strange. You know, that's so lots of times when I think old fashioned was what I thought. And suddenly I began to kind of see things differently. Like just the way you talk about things. So for instance, you know, we sing these old songs and to me, I kind of stopped thinking about those old songs. I thought, you know, for over a century, people with hard lives, people with struggles have come here and they've sang these songs and they've bonded together and they've pushed through life. And when we sing these songs, we've got this deep connection with our past, with camaraderie with people who have been through this and there's a lot of meaning to it and you know we sing and we sound kind of bad but you know and this isn't a shot at contemporary churches it's just you know seeing things different when i go to a, a big church or a big gathering now the lights are off and the music is amazing and you hear these talented singers you know and it sounds so good and you can just, you just feel all alone, you know, like it's dark and it's noisy and you're just all alone worshiping and it is just powerful. You come to our church and it's, it's, it's not like that, but you know what is going on? The lights are on and you're looking around and you're seeing your neighbor and you're seeing your mom and you're seeing your best friend and they're saying these words to these songs and you hear their, you hear their imperfect, imperfect voices and it, it doesn't, it doesn't sound good to your ear, but to your heart, uh, it just, you couldn't, you couldn't put that somewhere else. Like only in familiarity and fellowship and friendship can that exist. And, and so I just started seeing our church different and looking at our community and saying, you know, there are people who are going to be called, you know, churches work, I think like a color wheel. And so in our community, there's all these churches who who can we reach? And I think there was a group of people who needed something slow, needed something uh, that felt like family. And so I really started focusing on that. Really stopped listening to a lot of stuff about ways to make the church contemporary, ways to make the church relevant, you know? You know, here's one of the things. Jesus, there, one of the things I've clinged to lately, there's a parable. He's teaching in parables, and he asks the disciples, why do I, why do I teach in parables? And, or they ask him, why do you teach in parables? And he says, I teach in parables so that people don't understand. And the disciples, what do you mean? So people don't understand. And then he kind of goes on to say, you know, that the God reveals and something I've clung to at church now is that when you come into our church, it is, um, unattractive. It is a little room. It's either too cold or, or too hot, depending on who you ask, you know, uh, the music's not great. I'm, I'm in charge of cleaning and I'm pretty terrible. So it's touched dirty. Uh, 
nothing about it is, is extremely attractive. But there are people who come in and God grabs them there. Do you know what I mean? It's not something that they liked. It's something that they, they kind of felt, you know. Um, I've stopped trying to attract strangers to the church, which is a huge, to me, coming up, and what I heard when I was starting out in ministry was, we need to, we need to make the church a place where a stranger can walk in, feel welcome, and, um, and, and want to come back again. And I've, I've stopped doing that. If first off, if a stranger comes to church and no one knows them, I, I, I hope they like it, but, uh, I'm disappointed. No one in the church knows them. You know, like who is this person that none of us here know you, you know, I focus my attention on, I want the people that work with the people in my church. You know, I want them to bring the people. I want, I want you to go to work and I want you to be such a source of grace and light and peace that people you work with want to know what it is about you, you know, when they come to see. And when that happens, those people stay. Like those people come back. That's how we've grown is, is through stuff like that. And so, you know, that, that kind of takes me through years three to seven. Um, a few years ago, the church was doing good. And I was trying to decide what to do next. And I read a book that wasn't a Christian book. It was called uh, David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell. And uh, in the book, uh, he talks about, in the beginning, David and Goliath. And his point is that, you know, we look at David and Goliath as an upset. And it is an upset. But the upset isn't that David killed Goliath. It's that David cheated. Uh, You know, that Goliath is out here. And he's so intimidating. He's so big. And he's fierce and terrifying. And no one will go and fight him in a sword fight. Because it's a suicide mission. He's so tall. He's got this giant sword. You're not even going to get close to him. And so no one's going to step forward because they can't beat David in a, they can't beat Goliath in a sword fight. But you got this guy, David, who's so angry at what Goliath is saying about God that he doesn't care about having a sword fight with Goliath. His objective is not to fight Goliath. His objective is to kill Goliath. And so he goes out there with uh, his rock, you know, and we think that that's a silly weapon. But at the time, that was one of the three main weapons, uh, a guy, a slinger, could kill someone from three football fields away. I mean, it had the speed of a bullet. So this is not a toy. David had already said he'd killed a bear and a lion. And so the upset was that David looked at the situation, asked himself, what am I trying to accomplish? And did something different. Uh, and so I read that. And then it just goes through all these, you know, it talks about basketball, the press defense, how that's not really basketball. You know, you're ruining the game, but you'll win. And it just kind of gave all the examples of people who are desperate and did stuff others wanted to win. So what's your objective? So that was the big question. So I was asking myself, what is it that Sardis John Baptist Church, that Josh Johannes, what is it we're trying to do? And what we're trying to do is win our community to Christ. I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do. And so then I asked myself, all right, so are the things I'm doing aimed at that? And I thought, well, what's the, so if that's what we should be aimed at, what are we are aimed at? And I thought, you know what I feel like I'm aimed at right now? is getting people to come here on Sunday morning. That my drive in ministry is to get people to come here on Sunday morning. And so all of our, a lot of our money, a lot of our attention, a lot of our energy, is going into Sunday morning so to make it a place where somebody will come. And I thought, I've been telling my church to go over and over again. Go to where you work. Live it out. Uh, and so I thought, so, so how, how do I live that out? How do I do that even more? And so I decided to become a teacher, um, and I'm just not finishing that this year. And I want to go and, and, and pastor my church, teach at the school, and not preach Jesus at the school, but just like I tell the people in my church, if you're kind, if you're graceful, if you're living it out, uh, it's, it's seen, it's known, it's felt. You can change a place. And you, know, you asked me about friendship because I told you that was important to me. Um. You look at Jesus's ministry. I'm going to get in my preacher position now, you know. You look at Jesus' ministry. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he spends one year in ministry. And how does he spend most of his time? Because if I thought about it, what would I do? If I had one year and I'm Jesus, well, I'm performing a lot of miracles, right? I'm speaking to big, big crowds, as many as I can get. You know, announce it ahead of time. I'm going to be in Nazareth on the 13th. 
get the people there. But you look in the gospel, and he's always running away from crowds. Like there'll be a crowd, and he, and he runs away. And what Jesus does, which is ins- insane to think about, is he pours his time and his energy, the bulk of it, into 12 people. One of whom uh, comes to be possessed by the devil, you know, is a, is a, is a traitor. Uh, all of them will abandon him when, when he's in his hour of need. But he pours all of his energy, so much of his energy, into these 12 people. And I think, why? Why, why does he do that? It seems like a foolish thing to do. Uh, you know, I just preached about it this last week. So they crucify him. And I think that evil, I think that Satan thinks in killing Jesus, we've addressed the problem. But the problem is that who he was has been given to these 12, you know? And he's sending his Holy Spirit. And... So, looking at my church, thinking about friendship, what if in my life, you know, when I'm 80 years old, are there going to be 12 people that I can name who saw me live my life, I shared it with them, and they want to, do the, they want to follow Jesus the same way? Are there going to be 12 people? And it, it'd be awesome to have a, a giant crowd, you know, of people but that giant crowd, how will I know them? You know, ministry can be so lonely. Um, and so just thinking about what if, what if I can be with 12, you know? That's a powerful point for our listeners, and it's a powerful call to action. We're running out of time again. Uh, but Josh, if you could speak to someone from uh, your experience at Sardis, whether it's the beginning stages when you were lonely or, or those moments where you decided, this is it, I'm taking the call to action, I'm not going to be on the fence and I'm going to do this wholeheartedly. Or is it the moments where you decided that when people uh, come, you expect the church to already have impacted them outside the community? Whatever it is, from this whole story of your integration with Sardis Church, what would you call someone who's listening at a different church to do? I think uh, the worst thing that can happen for your career in ministry is that you fall in love. I feel like sometimes we're in a roundabout way told that, you know, like uh, keep your distance, build a team underneath you. You know, the big pastor at a church will not be called the teaching pastor. And the idea is that that pastor teaches, you know, and so a lot of the other jobs are going to be delegated to someone else. The teaching pastor teaches them. And unconsciously what happens is we look at it as a pyramid and we say, the most important guy, what does he do? He teaches. He knows stuff. And we, and we kind of put all of our emphasis on, on that position. Um, but when you fall in love with people, you lose all your power over them. You know what I mean? Like, well, now it's not you're lucky to have me here. It's I'm kind of lucky to be here. And, you know, when I think about my church, one of the things that I've, I've loved and that I look forward to is I've gotten to know these, these like little kids, seen them be born. Now they're growing up and I, I do children's church with them. I spend a lot of time with them. I know them. I love them. Uh, I'm going to get to see them grow up. going to get to see them follow after God. going to see them fail. going to see them struggle. They're going to see me fail and struggle. I, I mean, what I would tell somebody is stop looking for a career in ministry and just just do it. Just be it. I talk about the twelve. Someday I'm gonna I'm gonna grow old. They're gonna say, "Hey Josh, uh, let's let's move it on over," you know. And I'll sit there and I'll listen to the next thing going on. But I think a lot about the day when uh, I die. You know who will who will be there? I hope that. Uh, a lot of those kids that will have lived a life and have, have seen me from beginning to end will be able to say, well, he was the real deal. He was who he said he was. And that they've done the same in their life. I hope that they're, I hope they're there at my funeral and I hope that there's a group of kids behind them looking at them and thinking the same thing of them. And I hope that one day, you know, when I die, that I'm deep in the earth and there's a trumpet blast. I look up in the sky and I see Jesus. That's what I've been doing it for. You know, I hear 
my dad mowed yards and I hear so often ministers kind of complain about the hardships and I think I'm glad I'm not mowing yards. And I also think to myself that Jesus died on a cross, you know? So all of my complaining is going to kind of stop at a point because they've not crucified me yet. But I think about that day when I see Jesus in the air and I, I just can't wait to go up and meet him, to get to see him in person, the person I've, I've talked to my whole life, that I've been with my whole life. But then I think about looking sideways and seeing Mary Jean Beeler, who played the organ, seeing all these people that I loved and cared about, and they'll be there. And this church, the ones that have passed, the ones who are there, the ones I don't even know yet, just that, that being together. That's the thing I love the most. At I love a Pollock. I love the food. But I love just sitting there and talking. And my potlucks are so much more powerful than my sermons. If that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I don't think if you spend 40, 50 years in ministry and you don't have a friend, I think you did it wrong. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, that's, that's what I tell you. And here's one more thing. Here's one more thing I tell somebody looking to go into ministry. When you think about building a career, you think about what's going to help you the most. So lots of times you look for a job at a place that's booming. You want to go to a place where there's energy, the place where there's excitement. I would encourage someone to go somewhere no one wants to go and to, to suffer, to struggle, and to learn to rely on God. And then let God surprise you. You know what I mean? That's what I would I would tell somebody. Josh, you have a powerful message and an amazing testimony. And hopefully you can join us again sometime very soon. I would really like to dive into uh, your view on children's ministry. Uh, obviously, you, know, you had so much integrated with the youth. And, and we just barely touched on it today. But you have such a powerful message. Then I have something that people can take away. Of course, you can keep the conversation going. You can comment on this video. Also, make sure to check out other videos we have on our YouTube channel. And make sure to subscribe and hit that bell to be notified of every single video. We upload every single day and some days multiple videos. Also, check out our Facebook page. We have content there as well as our Instagram. You've been listening to Behind the Point. My name is Adam Robertson. God bless.